<clears throat> Justin is a man of great faith. He said I was going to preach just a very short message. <laughs> At least he believes in the impossible. <laughs> Sitting next to Terry, Terry made a comment to me and it was, how long were you here? Uh, I was here 12 years, you were here 13 years, Lee was here 14 years. <laughs> and Richard, there's a message in there for you. <laughs> You only start at 15 years. <laughs> well, I need not say this is a huge privilege for myself and for Terry and for Lee. Uh, it's great to sit among them this morning. Uh, I was a beneficiary of, of Terry's ministry, his dynamic leadership, preaching, and evangelistic ministry, and I reaped the benefits. I messed the church up and then Lee came and put it right. <laughs> you know, this is about as close as evangelical non-conformists get to apostolic succession. <laughs> so it's our privilege today to participate in Richard's induction. Now at first sight, the passage I'm going to read seems totally inappropriate and even counterintuitive. But let's read it and you'll see what I mean. It's 1 Corinthians chapter three, just the first nine verses. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are you not worldly? Are you not acting as mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the other who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For you are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Why on such a joyous occasion would I read a passage that focuses on spiritual immaturity and sub-Christian conduct? There is a method in my madness. Yes, Paul is addressing a problem in the church of Corinth but our attention this morning is not on the spiritual malady that plagued that church. Rather, our attention this morning is on the important principles that Paul enunciates in addressing that problem. You see, he draws our attention to what the church is and how churches, churches should see themselves and their pastors. So let me spend as little time as possible identifying the problem and as much as possible celebrating the solution. In a word, the problem was reductionism. The Corinthians had begun to think of the church as a human society and no more than that. And in a way, we can very easily do the same things. 
so many of the social dynamics that we encounter in a church mirror those that we come across in human societies, be these clubs, body corporates, or even political parties. So it is possible for us to forget that the church is, always was, and always will be more than that. Now the Corinthians had blurred their unique identity as the ecclesia, ordinary men and women called by God's grace into a unique fellowship. And one of the symptoms of that blurring was that there were some who were saying, I follow Paul. Others were saying, I follow Apollos. Still others were saying, I follow Peter or Cephas. And the super spirituals were saying, I follow Christ. There's an emphatic I there, the way that comes. So it wasn't so much about Paul or Apollos or Cephas or even Christ. It was I follow Christ. The emphasis in that sentence is on the I each time. And that was part of the problem. And Paul is saying to them, you have lost the plot. You have in fact demoted yourselves. Are you not acting as mere humans? You've forgotten what the church is. Now always, always, but especially on an occasion like today, we need to have an appropriate view of the church. Our Lord said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That was true when he said it and it is true today and it will always be true. There has never been a retraction. And in an atmosphere of meditative worship, Paul speaks to the Ephesians. And he says regarding the church, God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made manifest to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So Paul is emphatic when he reminds the Corinthians that we are God's church. Don't forget it, he says. We are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. He underlines this point. It's rather interesting that in the inflected languages like Hellenistic Greek, you could play around with the word order in order to emphasize something. Whereas we're obliged more or less to keep a regular word order or things don't make a whole lot of sense, in Greek you could change that order for emphasis. And this reads literally, God's co-workers we are, God's field you are, God's building. That's where the emphasis lies. Now somebody is bound to be saying, and I know you're polite, so you're only saying it under your breath. But surely, this is somewhat idealistic, this view of the church. We have seen the blemishes, not Rosebank Union, but the church from which we came. We've seen some blemishes. We're all too human as a society. Now friends, we know that. We have studied church history. For that matter, we observe the frailty of the church right there in the New Testament. There have been many dark days and unedifying episodes in church history. We are pastors. We know that we are not perfect. We understand that people carry baggage. They are works in progress. And sometimes they get up to mischief, to put it mildly. But we also know the other side of the story. We are part of a church that came into being against all odds. 
that should never have survived in the first place, but God's hand was on it. We have seen trophies of grace, and my pastor, pastoral friends here would tell you that right here in this church, we have been amazed at the work that God has done in many a life. We've seen trophies of grace. We've seen lives transformed. And we experience a unity, despite all our differences, that can only have been created by the Holy Spirit. I love the way Martin Luther says things sometimes. There's a candor about the way he's stated himself. And he said, we tell our Lord God that if he will have his church, he must look after it himself. We cannot sustain it. And if we could, we should become the proudest asses under heaven. If it had been possible for Pope, priest, or minister to destroy the church of Jesus Christ, it would have been destroyed long ago. Now we rejoice in God's hand of blessing on his church universal. But I want to tell you we have good reason to worship God and to thank him for his hand of blessing on this church. There have been some wonderful episodes. I am convinced that our church has, over the years, exerted an influence on this city that has changed it. Somebody's bound to say, really? There's a lot wrong with our city now. Materialism, crime, godlessness, true. But can you imagine how much worse things would be if there had been no church? There's been a profound influence. And were it not for the church of Jesus Christ, the occupation of people as light and as salt, things would have been far worse. Well, let me move on quickly. If we have an appropriate view of the church, we will also have an appropriate view of our pastors. In this church, it has never been customary to place our pastors on pedestals. We do not think of our pastors as spiritual celebrities. They do not have dictatorial powers. So Paul was quite clear. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. One plants the seed, another waters, but it is God who makes things grow. Now, I'm not speaking as a member of the pastor's trade union this morning. <laughs> By the same token, we are encouraged not only to love, but to respect and to honor our pastors. It's pretty easy for me to say that because I've been gone a long time. It may be wrong to think too much of our pastors, but it is equally wrong to think too little of them. We are told to acknowledge those who work hard among us, who care for us and admonish us. We are to hold them in the highest regard, in love, because of their work. So the time came for this church to appoint a new senior pastor. The process occupied many meetings. It took many hours. There would have been much prayer and careful deliberation. No doubt the committee did due diligence. I know one or two members of that committee. They are famous for doing due diligence. <laughs> the church's leaders would have been included in due course. And ultimately, the church as a whole. I don't have inside information, but I know something about Rosebank Union Church's track record. God has a way of leading his church. Now there is a popular term that is frequently used as churches contemplate the appointment of a new senior or lead pastor. 
more popular, I think, in North America than it is in South Africa, and you can be grateful for that. It is a most unfortunate term. They speak of hiring a pastor. It has become commonplace, so much so that many pastors actually own it and wear it and speak of the time when they were hired. At every opportunity, I have fought that abominable mischaracterization. I may well be engaged in a losing battle, but I'm not going down without a fight. The problem for me is the incursion of an unspiritual mindset, a secularized approach into a sacred, sacred appointment of a pastor. Now, if we take a biblical view of things, pastors are God's gifts to his church. Now, in the light of a biblically appropriate view of the church and its pastors, I want to address a few words of encouragement to you, Pastor Richard. In the nature of the case and the few things I'm going to say, there is reciprocity. In other words, when I address myself to you, Richard, I am also speaking to the church as a whole. There's always that reciprocity. When the Bible says, children, honor your parents, it also says that parents ought not to provoke their children to wrath. There's that reciprocity. I'm speaking to you, Richard, as a colleague, delighted that you're here. And I remind you, as I do myself, of three key roles we play as pastors. The first thing I'm going to say is not even one of those three. It's actually sufficiently important. I know that you have a commitment to expository preaching. Go for it, brother. Uh, we believe in that in this church, and the church has had expository preachers for many, many years, and that remains important. It is a given, and so I'm not going to say any much more about it here. But I would like to say these three things, highlight three aspects of pastoral ministry. Richard, as senior pastor of this church, you are called first and foremost to be a shepherd. I've had the privilege for several years now of teaching pastoral theology. Currently I do so online. And at the outset of the course, a question is put to the students about which they engage in the first of several online discussions. Here's how the question reads verbatim. Some city dwellers may never have even seen a live sheep. The shepherding analogy was appropriate in biblical days, but it is now outmoded and needs to be replaced by more relevant contemporary imagery that conveys the same essential values. Comment, please. <laughs> now, a few intrepid students take the bait and attempt to find a substitute. They discover in the course of the discussion that they simply cannot. Shepherding is a highly appropriate image. Even those of us who are ignorant of the intricacies of good shepherding can understand it. Philip Keller wrote a book entitled A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm in which he, as an experienced sheep farmer, explains the appropriateness of each clause in that psalm. We discover why those who lead the church are described as shepherds. We simply cannot lead a church unless we have shepherds' hearts. That's why Peter exhorts us to be shepherds of God's flock that is under our care. Paul tells us to be shepherds of the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. 
More importantly, the Lord refers to himself as the good shepherd. If you want to do yourself a favor, you go and read Ezekiel chapter 34, the whole lot, and then read John chapter 10, where the Lord says, I am the good shepherd. Now, having said this, I need immediately to qualify it in two ways. First of all, this is not a small church. It is impossible, as you well know, Richard, having pastored a big church, to have an intimate, personal relationship with each and every member of the flock. Friends, you cannot expect your senior pastor to pastor each member as he would in a smaller church. But he doesn't cease to be a shepherd. Rejoice in the pastoral dimension in his preaching and his pastoral example and leadership. Secondly, God has called him to be a shepherd, not a sheepdog. As a child, I grew up in Durban. Across the road from where we lived was a soccer field. At the end of the field was a largish home. The owner kept chickens, a whole lot of them, and a border collie. I was fascinated as a child to watch that sheepdog follow its instincts. It would chase those poor chickens in one direction, then charge around to the other side of them, marshalling them and chasing them backwards and forwards. There was no particular purpose, not that I knew of anyway, just a frenzied, instinctive to and fro. I would hazard a guess that these were either the fittest or the most exhausted <laughs> chickens in the entire Southern Hemisphere. By contrast, shepherding is purposeful. It involves caring for the weak and the wayward, but it is first and foremost directional guidance. The Middle Eastern shepherd goes ahead of the sheep. And so does the senior pastor as the leading under-shepherd in this church. Secondly, Richard, as senior pastor, you are called upon to give gentle but strong leadership. This goes with the role of shepherd. Now there are some who believe that it is best for a pastor to simply stay out of trouble, relinquish his or her role as leader, so as to be able to attend to the needs, the spiritual needs of parishioners. So they say, Pastor, you keep your nose clean. We'll handle the rough stuff. It's better for you to serve as a chaplain. No disrespect to those who serve honorably as chaplains. But wherever did we get that idea? Certainly not from the Bible. Now I'm not going to spend time trying to make a case for pastoral leadership other than to say that the pastoral role calls for godly, wise, gentle, strong leadership. Of course, it is never dictatorial or unilateral. It is always servant leadership, as you know, Richard. But you can only be a true servant if you are prepared to lead. Which leads me to say to you as a congregation, you need to know that this is far from easy. It requires courage. It sometimes leads to misunderstanding. We would like to be friends with absolutely everybody. My appeal to you is to recognize this fact and be supportive in every way possible. Thirdly, 
Richard, a senior pastor, you are also the church's lead missionary. Now, one of the characteristics of Rosebank Union Church, right from the first service in Ilovo in 1906, was that it was missional. It looked outwards to reaching and serving others, not inwards to satisfying its own needs. And this, of course, is what the church is. Dutch missiologist Johannes Blau states it so well. He says there is no other church than the church sent into the world and there is no other mission than that of the church of Christ. Between our time in Rosebank and our days in Hurlingham, we sojourned for about two years in a disused gereformeerde kerk in Bordeaux. We thought we were being smart So he erected a sign over the exit door which read, you are about to enter your mission field. The motivation was that everybody who left the church had very little option but to look at the sign that reminded them they were now to go out as missionaries. Now the intention was clear, but strictly speaking, without being pedantic, that sign was actually theologically inaccurate. You see, it is not possible to ever leave your mission field, not even while you are sitting in church. To be a Christian and to be in the world is to be a missionary. I can be a good missionary and I can be a bad missionary. I can be an effective missionary and I can be an ineffective missionary. The one thing I cannot be is a non-missionary. And so a pastor, among other things, has this huge privilege and responsibility of modeling. He doesn't have to go on every mission trip. You would soon complain about that. But of modeling a missional outlook to you as people. William Willimon served as a pastor for many years before becoming a bishop in the United Methodist Church in Alabama and subsequently a professor at Duke Divinity School. They tell me he's written 80 books and I will confess I have not read them all. I've read a few and one of the best book is called simply Pastor. In it, he examines the various roles that pastors play. One of these roles he describes as lead missionary. Of necessity, a church pastor has to look inwards and care for the flock. But he also leads a church to engage in mission. I love the way that Willimon actually contrasts what he calls a maintenance model and a missional model of church life. Listen to his wise words. Because the church is constantly tempted to withdraw from the danger and adventure of God's mission, turning the church into a kind of sanctified club for, over, for older adults, hunkered down safely with people just like us. Pastors must be leaders of mission. When faced with a need for change, the maintenance congregation says, if this upsets many of our members, we won't do it. The mission congregation says, if this will help reach someone outside our congregation, let's take the risk. The maintenance congregation says, the main thing is to be faithful to our past. The mission congregation says the main thing is to be faithful to God's promised future. And Willimon comments, with a resurrected Christ, we have more future ahead of us than past behind us. The maintenance congregation says, 
How many Methodists, now we'll change that to evangelicals. How many evangelicals live in our area? The missional congregation asks, how many unchurched people live within 20 minutes of this church? The maintenance congregation asks, how can we save our congregation? The mission congregation asks, how can we participate in God's salvation of the world? So let me conclude at last. There's much more we could say about pastoring today, of course. But I want to say just two really important things that I hope will be remembered. First of all, a comment to you, Pastor Richard, and then one to the church. Richard, we really do not believe you are here purely by human design. We believe that God led the search committee, the church's leadership, and the church as a whole to extend an invitation to you. In the final analysis, the call came from the church's chief shepherd. And you, dear friends, we believe that God has led Pastor Richard and Kristen to accept the church's invitation. We believe that we're not being presumptuous when we say, as did the church in Jerusalem, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. You have not hired your new senior pastor. He is God's gift to you. Do everything you can to make his life a pleasure, not a pain. Love him deeply. Respect him appropriately. Do it for God's sake. Pray for him regularly. Do it for God's sake, not your sake. Do it because he needs, as every pastor does, your support and your love. Make his work a joy, not a burden. And you know what? In doing so, you will derive maximum benefit from his ministry. Amen.